Thank you for joining us for the Bay Area Older Adults Spring at Blair Ranch Preserve Tour. So my name is Dr. Ann Ferguson, and I am Executive Director of Bay Area Older Adults, which I'll call BAO for short. So for those of you who are new, BAO is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well-being of more than 50,000 adults age 50 plus each year. We trek on nature trails, we learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, experience new culinary flavors, and help connect you to people with shared interests. So let's start by talking about insects, since there are a lot of insects living at Blair Ranch, the preserve we're visiting today. So some cool facts about insects. Insects have been on the earth for about 350 million years. And compared to humans, we've only been on the earth for 300,000 years. There are about 91,000 different species of insects in the United States and 1.5 million different species in the world. This only includes the ones we have found and named. About one third of all insect species are carnivorous and most hunt for their food rather than eating decaying meat or dung. Does anyone know the main differences between spiders and insects? So one thing spiders and insects have in common is that they are both invertebrate with an exoskeleton. The differences are insects have six and spiders have eight legs. Insects have two compound eyes and spiders have eight simple eyes. Insects have three body parts or segments and spiders have two body parts. Insects have two antennae and up to four wings, and spiders have none of these. One type of insect found at Blair Ranch Preserve is butterflies. There are approximately 750 species of butterflies in the United States and 63 different species of butterflies in the Bay Area. Most of us think of butterflies as bright colored and easy to spot, but if they were that easy to spot, then most of them would be eaten by predators such as birds, lizards, and snakes. One way butterflies avoid predators is camouflage to blend in with their environment. Here's an example of a butterfly that looks like a living leaf with veins and even some brown patches that look like stems. This one's called Gontorex ramki. And it's a butterfly found in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Some butterflies disguise themselves as dried brown or dead leaves, like the leaf wing butterfly shown here that is found from Central to South America. Other butterflies blend into the flowers they most frequently eat, such as this orange tip that is found in California. As you can see, the underside of their wings are model green and white, which offers perfect camouflage when they land on flower heads, such as mustard, which is one of their host plants. Still others, like the angel shades, blend into the branches they sit on. They are found all over Europe and as far east as Syria. Many of you have seen the California buckeye that has four distinct eyes on their wings that make them look like a larger animal. This scares predators so the butterfly can make a quick getaway. Even better, some other butterflies' wings look like snakeheads. Butterflies, like the glass wings and satyrines, 
have wings that appear transparent in order to hide themselves from predators. Others have false antennae on their wingtips to fool a predator into attacking the edge of their wing instead of their head and abdomen. Some of the most colorful butterflies don't need to hide because they are poisonous to their predators. The poison in a butterfly's body comes from the plants it eats as a caterpillar. For example, the endangered monarch caterpillars feed on the poisonous milkweed plant, and these poisons become part of their body when they become adults. Predators know not to eat them. Now that we learned a little about butterflies, it's time for a quick quiz question. Which of the choices below is not a strategy that butterflies use to avoid predators? All right, so the correct answer is the strategy butterflies don't use to avoid their predators is that they are faster than their predators. So today we're taking a tour of Blair Ranch Preserve, which is closed to the public. We got a special permit for myself, an entomologist, and two naturalists to spend five hours searching for all kinds of wildlife. One of the special features of this preserve is that it has a pond that is home to the endangered western pond turtles. We also saw lots of other wildlife, mammals, wildflowers, and other plants, and lots of insects, of course. So let's start the tour. Today we are exploring Blair Ranch Preserve, an 865-acre private property in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains, which was a cattle ranch owned by the Blair family since the 1950s. It was purchased by the Peninsula Open Space Trust, or POST, in 2007, with funding assistance from the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, Santa Clara County Parks, the California Coastal Conservancy, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Post transferred ownership to the Open Space Authority. Blair Ranch has eight miles of ranch roads that can be used as trails. Blair Ranch is connected to Rancho Caneda del Oro and will eventually become part of this preserve. It is tucked in the middle of county parks and other preserves. Southwest of Blair Ranch is Uvas Canyon County Park, to the north is Calero County Park, and to the west is Sierra Azul and the Mount Omenum Peak. There are views of Loma Prieta, the highest peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains, at 3,800 feet. Together, these nearby protected areas make possible wildlife corridors along the eastern side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. On this exploration, I am joined by two California naturalists, Mike Hunt and Kathy Dollard, as well as an entomologist, Mara Vonchak. We are in search of endangered western pond turtles, a variety of insects, groves of blue oak trees, and more. We start out at 680 feet elevation on a paved fire road that led to a 15 foot wide Yagas Creek crossing and we cross it without getting our hiking boots too wet. 
Yagas Creek is a perennial stream whose source is on the eastern side of Crystal Peak near Loma Prieta. The creek flows east along Casa Loma Road, then turns south at Uvis Road. It passes through Chesboro Reservoir, around Lake Silviera Habitat Preserve, and through the cities of Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy before connecting to the Pajaro River and ultimately Monterey Bay. Hugges Creek is home to the federally threatened South Central California Coast Steelhead. These fish have been in long-term decline across their range, despite recent recovery actions taken in critical watersheds. Examples of recovery actions are restoring stream flows in places where there used to be a dam or where the water was redirected to lakes and quarries. In South Santa Clara County, Yagas Creek was diverted for a quarry in Morgan Hill. Recently, Valley Water created a new freshwater wetland habitat at the location of the former quarry and restored water flow into Yagas Creek by releasing water from upstream Chesbro Reservoir. They will also repopulate the area with native plants, amphibians, reptiles, and other fish. On the other side of the creek, among gray black stones, we find a beautiful deep red flowering plant called the scarlet monkey flower. It is more common to see its orange colored cousin called the sticky monkey flower, so this is a treat. Scarlet monkey flower is a small native shrub that lives in wet soils near creek beds. Its flowers have five bright red fused petals with two petals facing up and three hanging down. Its yellow stamens are long, extending beyond the petals. The plant has green leaves that look like they have black pepper sprinkled on them. The plant's common name originates from the fact that its flowers look like a monkey's face. It is an important food source for hummingbirds who hover while feeding on its rich nectar. Even though it is late in the season, we spot some globe lilies, elegant clarkia, and a bee pollinating a chaparral honeysuckle, a hardy shrub endemic to California that looks like a bunch of sturdy vines masquerading as an evergreen shrub. It is known to send out long arching shoots that sprawl over neighboring shrubs in search of light. It has small yellow flowers with stamens that extend from the rolled back lips. Native Americans bundled the long twigs and branches of this plant into brushes and brooms. We reach an open meadow of tall grasses with hundreds of violet colored flowers that Kathy tells me are silver lupins, another native California plant. Its name originates from its silver leaves that have a feathery texture. This plant is bitter tasting from two toxic chemicals, so deer stay away from it. Unfortunately, cows may mistakenly eat it, which can cause birth defects and decreased weight, especially in young, inexperienced cattle. Interestingly, the federally endangered Mission Blue Butterfly lays eggs singly on leaves, stems, flowers, and seed pods of silver lupin. Its caterpillar is dependent on silver lupin for food, eating its flowers and inner tissues. Adult butterflies may also eat silver lupin. Predators learn not to eat the adult Mission Blue Butterflies because it tastes bitter and can be toxic. This small, delicate butterfly has a wingspan of up to 1.5 inches. The tops of its wings are blue and lavender with black edges. The Mission Blue Butterfly was first collected in 1937 from the Mission District of San Francisco, and this is where it got its common name. A small colony is located on Twin Peaks in San Francisco. Next, Kathy finds a plant 
that has greenish to gray-green stems and narrow leaves with bright yellow flowers called golden yarrow. Its yellow flower is actually a flower within a flower within a flower. What first appears to be a single flower, on closer inspection, consists of several small daisy-like flowers in a cluster. Each daisy consists of two types of flowers. The eye of the daisy contains tiny symmetrical flowers and each petal around the edge is a single asymmetrical flower. The base of the plant produces many gray and woolly stems. Golden Yarrow's genus name, Europhyllum, means woolly leafed. The species name, Conferta floridum, means crowded flowers. At this point in our walk, we are off the ranch road and traversing dried grasses. On the ground, Mike spots the carcass of a southern alligator lizard that's missing its tail. This lizard was about five inches long, so it's likely a juvenile. The common name alligator lizard is a reference to the fact that the back and belly scales of these lizards are reinforced by bone, just like alligators. Alligator lizards have brown, gray, green, or yellowish colored body and dark red or brown crossbands with white spots across their back, sides, and tail. They range in size from 5 to 12 inches long with their tail. They have a round, thick body with small legs, and like many other lizards, they can drop their tail if attacked, which gives them time to flee. However, tail regeneration is energetically expensive. Reproductive fitness and survival have been shown to decrease during the regeneration process. Some interesting facts about these lizards. They can live up to 15 years. Just like snakes, they shed their skin in a single intact piece by essentially turning it inside out as they crawl out of it. With their large heads and powerful jaws, alligator lizards are very capable carnivores feeding on invertebrae, such as insects, and sometimes even small young mammals and birds that are close to or greater than their own size. Mike is an expert in animal scat identification. He spots fecal droppings that look like clumps of pellets and identifies it as belonging to black-tailed deer. Black-tails are a subspecies of mule deer and are smaller and darker than mule deer. They are found in Western North America from Northern California into the Pacific Northwest of the United States and coastal British Columbia in Canada. As their name suggests, black-tailed deer have a wide triangular tail with a dark brown or black top and a white underside. Deer use all of their senses to survive. They communicate with the aid of scent and pheromones from three different glands located on their lower legs. Their outside lower leg produces an alarm scent. The inside of their rear leg serves as a mutual recognition. And the gland between their toes leaves a scent trail. Their large ears can move independently of each other so they pick up any sounds that may signal danger. In the shade underneath some trees, Kathy points out a plant called ocean spray. Another common name is ironwood, due to the strength of its wood. Native Americans used its wood for tools and utensils. The wood becomes even harder by heating it over a fire so it could be used for fishing hooks, needles, canoe paddles, bows, spears, harpoons, and arrow shafts. Later, ocean spray pegs were used in construction when nails were not readily available. Ocean spray can be identified by its leaves because they are lobed with two teeth on each lobe of its leaves. The upper surface is green and the underside is pale and soft. Its scientific name is Holodiscus discolor, with discolor originating from its two colored leaves. The plant has cascading cream-white flower clusters that droop 
and provides good cover for birds, small mammals, and amphibians such as the Pacific tree frog. Its seeds were eaten by Native Americans who also used them as medicine. Among the elegant clarkia and dried grasses, Kathy finds a butterfly whose upper wings are checkered bright orange and black and underside hind wings have large silver spots. This butterfly is called a gulf fritillary. The Latin word fritillus means chessboard. This butterfly was introduced to the Bay Area back in the early 1900s and became more abundant in the 1950s. Gulf fritillaries use chemicals to avoid predators and to mate. They release odorous chemicals in response to predator sightings so common predators learn to avoid the species. Pheromones play a critical role in courtship. Males emit sex pheromones that help them attract females. We reach a pond called Hidden Lake, a location where fish, western pond turtles, snakes, butterflies, dragonflies, and other insects thrive. I am happy that we have Merov with us because the pond is bustling with a variety of insects. We see schools of gray-green fish in the water, and you may wonder how do fish get into ponds like this one if they don't have wings to fly or feet to walk? There are three main ways for fish to end up in new ponds. The first is that the pond forms as part of an existing water system and ecosystem, complete with algae, insects, and fish. This happens when a pond forms after a dam is made by humans, beavers, or natural events. A second way is that local flooding can cause lakes and rivers to overrun their shores, emptying into new valleys and low-lying land. That creates new ponds when the floodwaters pull back. A second, less common method is that certain fish, such as walking catfish, can travel over land to get from one water source to another. Don't worry, these fish are native to Southeast Asia and have only been found in states such as Florida. The third, most common way fish get into an isolated pond like Hidden Lake is that birds of prey drop their catch by mistake into the pond. Local mammals may transport fish eggs on their fur and humans purposely put fish into ponds and lakes for recreational purposes. Merov and I find many different insects hovering over the pond water or crawling along its shores. Our first insect encounter is with a widow skimmer dragonfly perched on top of a blade of grass. They love being around warm waters like this pond. It is easy to identify because the outer third of its fore and hind wings are transparent. The middle third is white and the inner half is dark brown. Immature males and females lack the white on their wings, so this must be a mature male. Are you curious how widow skimmers got their common name? It stems from the fact that the male skimmers leave the female by herself after she lays her eggs, rather than guarding the egg-laying female like other dragonflies. Widow skimmers are a helpful insect to have around your home because they can eat thousands of mosquitoes and biting flies. They catch their prey using their legs and use their fangs to bring the prey into their mouth. Merov spots her favorite insect climbing up dried grass. It's an assassin bug, 
and it is another insect you want to have in your garden. There are 7,000 species of assassin bugs around the world and at least 13 genera of assassin bugs in California. These dark brown or black bugs are a little over an inch long with red or orange spots along the edge of their bodies. They have a tiny head compared to their pear-shaped body. Assassin bugs are general predators and feed on pests in your garden in addition to bees, lacewings, lady beetles, and other insects. The assassin bug stabs its prey with its needle-sharp mouth part, called a proboscis, and injects a toxin that paralyzes its prey. The toxin also liquefies the insides of the victim, so the bug can suck out its insides like sipping a drink with a straw. When done feeding, it leaves behind an empty shell. This predatory behavior is so successful they can even consume insects larger than themselves. Assassin bugs have voracious appetites and are almost always on the prowl. They sometimes use ploys to attract victims, such as coating their forelegs with sap or leaving the carcass of a dead bug as bait to lure a live one. The bugs may hide under a rock or piece of bark, creep up on its victim, then quickly snatch it with its front legs. Certain species feed on the blood of birds, mammals, reptiles, and even humans. We get closer to the water and in the plants floating on the water's surface, we find a California red-sided garter snake waiting patiently for prey and basking in the sun to help them stay warm. They are very good swimmers, so it's common to see them near ponds, streams, and marshes. This snake is about two feet in length, and it's easy to see the yellow stripe down its back, contrasting against its dark olive skin. Garter snakes have toxins in their saliva, which can be deadly to their prey, and their bite might produce an unpleasant reaction in humans, but they are not considered dangerous to humans. These snakes are most active during the day and feed on frogs, newts, fish, birds, small mammals, reptiles, and more. There is evidence that when garter snakes eat our local roughed skinned newts, they retain the deadly neurotoxin found in the skin of the newts for several weeks, making the snakes poisonous to predators that eat them. Meriv uses a white plastic spoon to scoop up a light green damselfly nymph from the pond water. Most of a damselfly's life is spent as a nymph, living up to five years underwater before becoming an adult. Nymphs are slender, have six legs, stubby wings, and they look like they have a propeller sticking out of their butt. These are actually their gills. They swim by undulating their bodies, which means they are slow. We spot another damselfly nymph that is brown and crawling in the mud by the shore. Nymphs are important predators of mosquitoes, midges, and other small insects, and are known to attack small fish and shrimp using its extendable, scoop-like jaw with teeth to snatch and draw in the prey. Nearby, we see an indescript female dragonfly hovering over the water, stopping, and laying her eggs onto the water's surface, which creates ring waves of different sizes that separate into ripples. There are more flying insects around the water's surface. We catch a pair of blue damselflies mating. Dragonfly and damselfly mating styles are unique. The male grasps a female by the back of the head with its rear abdominal claspers. The claspers fit into specific grooves in the female. In this way, the pair can fly around together in what is called a tandem position, like we see them flying over the pond. Next, the female curls the tip of her abdomen to meet the male's accessory genitalia and sperm is transferred. This is called the wheel position because they form a circle or heart shape. Mating can take from a few seconds to many hours. After copulation, the male may immediately release his mate and fly away, like the widow skimmer, 
or he may follow her around to guard her from other males while she lays her eggs in water. In some species, like the blue damselflies, the pair stays in tandem during the egg laying process. Another much larger butterfly with striking yellow and black striped wings and spots of blue and orange near its tail is relaxing in the mud. This is a pale swallowtail and it looks very similar to the western tiger swallowtail which has yellow near its tail instead of orange. Its wings and abdomen are creamy white with black stripes. This is one of the largest butterflies with a wingspan of up to 4 inches. Interestingly, male pale swallowtails flock in large numbers at pudding parties to suck water from moist soil to obtain nutrients to help them in matings. I'm impressed with this next insect we find, the pygmy grasshopper that is about a half an inch long. It looks like it is wearing army camouflage and its tan, brown, and olive colorings blends in perfectly with the mud and plants of the shoreline as it nibbles its lunch. These grasshoppers love water and they eat mosses, fungi, algae, and organic muck by the shoreline. They lack sound producing and hearing organs. Toad bugs are their biggest predators. Speaking of toad bugs, we spot two big-eyed toad bugs hopping along the shore of the pond. One even hops on top of the other one. Their exoskeleton is a mixture of dirt-colored browns and tans with rough, warty, bumpy backs that help them blend in with soil, sand, or rocky shorelines they inhabit, which makes them challenging to find. Toad bugs not only look like toads, they leap like them too. They eat other insects and capture them by pouncing on them. Like the amphibian, toad bugs have large bulging eyes and wide round bodies. The main way you can distinguish them from toads is that they have six skinny stick-like legs. Finally, we see a western pond turtle popping its head up above the water's grasses. Its head and legs are a mosaic of black and yellow, and it is staring right at me with its pointy snout and beady eyes. People will tell you the turtle shell feels smooth like a river rock. The shape of a turtle shell indicates how much time it spends in the water. Individuals spending more time on land will have a more rounded shell, while those with a flat shell spend more time in the water. The turtle goes back underwater and I can see its dull olive shell is covered with black spots. This is the first time I have seen the west coast's only native freshwater turtle up close. This is because it is hard to find. Its population have been decreasing and it is a species of special concern in California. It all started back in the late 1800s during the fur trade and gold mining when an estimated 18,000 pond turtles were consumed each year in turtle soup, a delicacy served at high-end San Francisco restaurants. Next, urban development increased and non-native species were introduced, such as bullfrogs and largemouth bass that eat newly hatched turtles. Things got even worse when pets like the red-eared slider turtles were released into their habitat and competed for food and space. This is why it is so important that Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority protects this piece of land and the pond where the western pond turtles are thriving. I see another western pond turtle swimming across the water. They are expert swimmers using their webbed feet to swim underwater, but they prefer to bask in the sun on rocks, logs, or floating vegetation. It is common to see a group of turtles basking in the sun, but they are known to quarrel over sunning spots. They sun themselves intermittently to maintain an average body temperature of 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Western pond turtles are omnivores, feeding on small frogs, fish, aquatic insects, and plants. 
Strangely, western pond turtles cannot swallow food in air, only in water. The good thing is that these turtles can live an average of 50 years, which means many years of producing offspring. We leave the pond and walk uphill through the blue oak groves that are numerous in this preserve. Blue oak is endemic to California and are medium-sized deciduous trees growing up to 80 feet tall with up to a 3 foot wide trunk. The tree's bark is smooth and light gray with many medium-sized dark cracks. From a distance it appears almost white. The name blue oak derives from the dark blue-green tint of its shallowly lobed leaves. Its leaf has a grainy appearance and texture and will break if bent in half. Blue oak acorns are approximately one inch long with a narrow base and have a moderately sweet and tasty kernel. Acorn flour was a very important food source for the natives of California and continues to be made and used to this day. Acorn meal must first be treated to remove its bitter tasting compounds called tannins before it is used for cooking. Blue oak also provided wood for building and making utensils, for fuel, as a dye, and as medicines. Several rare or threatened species use blue oak woodland habitat. For instance, bald eagles, golden eagles, peregrine falcons, California condors, and the foothill yellow-legged frog inhabit blue oak woodlands. California spotted owls and purple martins use them for nesting. Blue oak is the most drought tolerant of all the deciduous oaks in California, which may mean it's more likely to survive the effects of climate change. The trees can withstand extreme drought by dropping their leaves and going dormant. Once water becomes available, it produces a flush of new leaves. What also helps is the fact that their blue-gray-green leaf color reduces heat absorption and it has an extensive root system that extends up to 80 feet deep to reach groundwater. We walk further up the hill on a layer of dried leaves. Among the brown leaves on the ground, Mike spots a funnel web, which is a trampoline-like horizontal web constricting back into a funnel or hole. The funnel web spider waits in the mouth of the funnel for prey to fall on the horizontal surface. Although the web is not sticky, the prey's legs get entangled in it. Then the funnel web spider rushes out at lightning speed, grabs and bites the prey to paralyze it, and takes it back to its funnel to consume. Without seeing the spider, it is hard to tell which of the dozens of different California spider species that build funnel webs made this one. These spiders get their name because of the small funnel-like tube of their web that leads to a silken burrow in which the spider hides. They are gray or brown with spots on their backs, banded legs, and eight eyes arranged in two rows. They are nocturnal and feed primarily on insects. Most spiders of this species are harmless to humans, but the bite of the Australian funnel spider causes wound necrosis. 
Almost at the top of the hill, we find a frog the size of my thumb swimming gracefully in the water of a cattle trough. The underside of its hind legs are yellow, and it has alternating dark brown and tail coloration on its legs and dark brown spots on its body. Distinguishing features are a dark eye stripe and small toe pads that allow them to cling to vertical surfaces like tree trunks. This is a Sierran tree frog. To avoid being eaten, the Sierran tree frog is fast. It can jump long distances and swim quickly to hide. They can also change color from green and gray to brown and even black to camouflage themselves. Sierran tree frogs are known to hitchhike in horticulture shipments traveling from California to Florida. During mating, a male sits on the back of the female and squeezes the eggs out of her. She lays eggs in gelatinous masses almost as large as she is. Then he releases the sperm over the eggs. We reach the top of the hill and walk over to scan the landscape and see Mount Hamilton and Coyote Ridge in the distance. The water tank on the hill marks the high point of the trail at almost 1,500 feet. On the hillside, we spot a couple of female brownish-gray mule deer. One gracefully runs away from us downhill, and the other stops and stares at us. She wags her tail and flicks her ears in an attempt to rid herself of the flies surrounding her body, and then runs away. Mule deer's defining characteristic are their large ears, which are about three-fourths the length of their head. These deer get their name from their big mule-like ears. They have a distinctive black forehead or mask, a white rump patch, and a small white tail with a black tip. When running, they bounce in a motion called stotting, in which all four hooves push off the ground at the same time. We start to head downhill on a fire road to get back to the preserve entrance. On a nearby coast live oak tree, we find a tree hopper, an insect related to cicadas, sitting peacefully on a thin branch. Tree hoppers pierce plant stems with their beaks and feed on the sap. They excrete the digested sap as honeydew, which other creatures like ants and wasps love to eat. Ants and wasps will follow the tree hopper around eating its leftovers and fight to protect the tree hopper against predators. These insects are known to be masters of disguise. Sometimes their mimicry shapes the tree hopper's whole body and in other cases it manifests in their pronotum, a segment just behind the bug's head that can stick up like an elaborate crest. They can resemble plant thorns, ants, fungus, wasps, and twigs. The one we found blends in perfectly with the green leaves of the coast live oak, but this one from South America looks like it has an ant perched on its back. There are more coast live oak trees harboring insects. The next one we find is a sausage flower gall wasp that is growing on the catkin of the tree. Catkins are the slender cylindrical flower clusters of the tree. Gall wasps are notable for their ability to stimulate the growth of galls or tissue swellings on plants. You may have noticed objects that look like apples in oak trees during the autumn months. These are oak apple galls. The female wasp lays her eggs in the plant tissue. The egg eventually hatches into a larvae, then the larva secretes chemicals that stimulate the plant tissue to rapidly grow so it can feast on the plant tissue. This means the plant provides both food and shelter. The larva will eventually develop into an adult within the gall. Once the adult wasp matures, it chews its way out of the gall and escapes. Each species of gall wasp causes a characteristic type of gall to form and these can be different colors and shapes. Many of these wasps attack oak trees or rose plants. This gall does indeed look like a green sausage 
hanging down from the slender tree branch and it blends in perfectly with the color of the coast live oak leaves. On the final path to the park entrance we find eight spiny leaf galls on a cluster of wild rose bush leaves. The galls are intricate yellow-green balls with many protruding red spines. What is amazing is that the wasps that cause these galls are only a quarter of an inch in size. If you cut open one of these galls, you will find many larvae crawling around inside. Fortunately, under most circumstances, the galls do not harm the plants or trees. Before we get back to our car, we spot some leaves that remind us of mint. I pick a couple, put them up to my nose, and smell their sweet aroma. As we say our goodbyes, all four of us feel grateful to have seen so many endangered western pond turtles and a diversity of insects, especially the well-camouflaged ones. I want to thank Kathy Dollard, Mike Hunt, and Mara Vonchek for sharing their expertise with me on the trails. The last question is to please rate your satisfaction with today's program on a scale from very satisfied to very unsatisfied. Please go to your polling tab to record your rating. This presentation and other park tours, as well as other videos, are available on BAO's video page. If you know anyone else who would appreciate this video, feel free to share the link to this park video with them.